Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it gives me great pleasure to be talking to you tonight about trunk blocks as part of our joint symposium with the Royal College of Anesthetists and RUK. And I'd like to thank Professor Harriet Griffiths for asking us to join the Royal College on this exciting venture. I work here at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital, and this is St. Thomas's just before a recent night shift. I do have some disclosures. The only thing that's really relevant for today is the fact that the anatomy images and videos I've been taking have all come from this complete anatomy app. So this is a paper that you'll all be familiar with and where the plan A blocks were derived from. And I'm gonna be talking about the chest wall and abdominal midline components, namely the, namely the erector spiny and erector sheath blocks. And if you're interested, these images have come from an exciting venture we've been working on. Uh, we produced some plan A block posters, which will be launching at the end of the webinar, thanks to the hard work of Anne Barron, Stuart Wade and Craig Johnston. So it's my job to talk to you about indications, anatomy and techniques of these two blocks. So let's start with the rector sheath block. Why do we like the rector sheath block? Well, we like it because it's simple, it's safe, it's versatile and it's effective. But what can you use it for? Well, mainly for surgery on the midline uh, of the abdomen, so laparotomy or paraambulical surgery, and it involves numbing the nerves that carry sensation between T6 and L1, so we're blocking, blocking the anterior rami of these. The rectus abdominis muscle is a paired midline muscle that runs from the xiphoid and costal cartilages down to the pubic symphysis and pubic crest. If we have a look at the muscle in its upper aspect in cross section, you'll see it's a thick tubular muscle covered by a sheath. And that sheath is formed by the external and internal obliques at the anterior component and the internal oblique and transversus abdominis at the posterior component. It then lies on transversalis fascia and peritoneum. Now the nerves that we're blocking pass through the tap plane between internal oblique and transversus abdominis and then come through and pass through the main part of the muscle to supply the skin and tissue in front of that. The aim is to put local anesthetic between the posterior border of the muscle and the posterior rectus sheath, making sure that we avoid the epigastric vessels that lie within the substance of the muscle. If you have a look at the muscle in cross section in the lower midline, below the arcuate line, you'll notice something different. Namely, the fascias of the external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis all pass in front of the muscle only. So there's only an anterior rectus sheath. There is no posterior rectus sheath, which means that this part of the abdomen, the rectus abdominis lies directly on the transversalis fascia. So what does this look like? What are the muscles that we're looking at in, uh, when we're aiming to generate our sonoanatomical image? Well, let's have a look. So here you've got the external oblique and its fascia the internal oblique and its fascia. When we remove that, you've got rectus abdominis lying on top of the transversus abdominis. And you'll see now when we zoom in on transversus abdominis, here it is, and there are the nerves that we're blocking lying between transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. If we place a probe in the upper part of the abdomen, we see the posterior rectus sheath and transversus fascia forming this tram line appearance. But if we slide down below the arcuate line, as there's no posterior rectus sheath, we don't get tram lines, we just see the rectus abdominis muscle lying on top of the transversalis fascia. How about generating an image? So let's place a linear probe on the lateral abdominal wall. We'll go past the tap block muscles, and there we see in cross section the feather like muscle of the rectus abdominis. We'll slide towards the midline, towards the linear alba right over here, and then across onto the rectus muscle on the other side. Let's go back onto the rectus that we're looking at. You see that tram line appearance. And as we slide the probe down through the abdomen, you'll see as the posterior rectus sheath disappears, you lose the tram lines. As we go below the arcuate line, there you see the epigastric vessels lying right below the rectus abdominis muscle. So what do we do with the technique? How do we, how do we cite the block? We tend to have our patient supine. We use a linear probe, and more often than not, we inject in-plane, and we need in-plane from lateral to medial. We tend to put somewhere between 10 to 20 millilitres of local anaesthetic per side, and we aim to stay above the danger zone. I call it the danger zone, this red line below the arcuate line. So we want to stay above the arcuate line. Now you've got a choice. You can either do your injection at two points, sort of periumbilical, so 10 to 20 mils on one side, 10 to 20 mils on the other side. But if you want to get more of a generous spread, you can fractionate that dose and have a four point injection two points just below the costal, costal margin and two points just below the umbilicus. The ultimate aim is to, to achieve this ideal loss of sensation right through the midline over there, although in practice it may be quite not as accurate as that. 
So what does a blot look like in real life? Well, here's a skinny patient, a nice linear probe in plane going through the muscle. Look at that muscle lifting off the posterior rectus sheath, forming that beautiful lens-like opening up of local anesthetic. And deep to the needle, you've got the epigastric vessels there. But look how wonderfully that space is opening up with local anesthetic. So that's clearly an ideal block in an ideal patient who's very skinny. What about if you did the same block in a patient that was perhaps less skinny than that? Um, so let's have a look. This is a less ideal patient. See a slightly steeper angle of the needle. It's coming through the substance of the muscle. Just before we get to the posterior aspect of the muscle, we're going to do a little test injection. You see an intramuscular injection here. There it is there. And now advance the needle, aiming to find the needle tip a little bit further. The needle's going to go a little bit further now. And there, post, it rests on the posterior rectus sheath, and there's the end point there. Now, that was tricky for a number of reasons, but mainly because that was me demonstrating the block on myself. So what about some tips to finish up with? Um, use color Doppler. Make sure you can identify where the, the epigastric vessels are. You can do this block preoperatively before you start surgery, or you can do it post-op even when the dressings are on, because the rectus muscle actually spreads some way away from the midline. It's a great place to put catheters. Uh, you can either do the catheters yourself at the end of surgery, or you can get the surgeons to put them in under direct vision. Now remember, this technique will give you somatic analgesia only, so you will need to give some form of analgesia to cover the visceral component of your surgery. It's worthwhile, in certainly in the slightly larger patients, confirming your, your target or the rectus muscle by scanning from the tap muscles, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. And also, once you've injected local anesthetic, you can as assess the spread by rotating the probe through 90 degrees and scanning up and down the long axis of the muscle. So let's see what I mean by the first of those points. So you can start scanning literally from external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis, and see that point when you go past the linear semilunaris to identify the rectus. And here's the probe rotated through 90 degrees, scanning up and down the length of the muscle. You can see the rectus muscle in long axis here. So this is a useful way to assess spread of local anesthetic. Okay, let's now uh, summarize. So the rectus sheath block is simple and safe. It's important to stay above the arcuate line. It's a great place to cite catheters, and you can use it as actually as a single block technique to, for rescue pain relief and recovery. Okay, let's now move on to the second of the two blocks, the erector spiny plane block. So why do we like the ESP block? Well, it's simple, it's safe, and it's versatile. The indications we're talking about here are specifically for chest wall procedures, so breast surgery, thoracic surgery, or analgesia, or for rib fractures. But depending upon what level you do the block, whether it's cervical, upper, mid, lower thoracic, or even lumbar, there are many other potential indications for the ESP block emerging. When we first decided on the ESP block, it generated quite some controversy. People said, what's wrong with the thoracic epidural? Why not thoracic paravertebral? And hey, why not the serratus plane block? Well, the thoracic epidural is a, a technique that is performed less and less nowadays. And I don't think you can guarantee that every single anesthetist finishing training will be competent or confident to cite them now. The thoracic paravertebral is certainly not a beginner's block and it's not something for everybody to perform. Uh, we could quite easily have used the serratus plane block, but we've opted to go for the erector spinae plane block because it's got similar principles to serratus and other fascial plane blocks. There's a shallow learning curve, it's eminently teachable, it's versatile, and it's low risk. So what is this erector spinae plane? Well, if you look at the skin of the back and then the muscles, the paraspinal muscles, you've got trapezius, rhomboid, and erector spinae. Above the transverse processes, you see the paravertebral space there and the lung. The erector spinae plane is this area below the erector spinae muscle. However, take care, the erector spinae is not just one muscle. So let's have a look at the anatomy in a bit more detail. Take away the skin, you've got trapezius, you've got the rhomboid muscles, and deep to that, you've got this group of muscles collectively known as erector spinae. Deep to erector spinae, you've got the transverse processes, and let's have a look in a bit more detail. You can start to appreciate now where you're gonna be sticking your needle on that tip of the transverse process. But how do the ESP blocks work? It's a really good question, and we don't really know the answer to that. It makes sense if the needle comes in and makes contact with the transverse process, you'll be in close proximity to the dorsal ramus. So it will make sense that needle injected there, injecting local anesthetic spreading in the Keflab and Corda direction will get the dorsal ramus for midline surgical procedures. But actually, it may well spread towards the ventral ramus, giving you a paravertebral block by proxy. 
and it could even spread, and in some studies it's been shown to spread, to cover the lateral cutaneous branch deep to serratus, so kind of like a serratus plane block by proxy. So we don't really know how it knows, how it works, and cadaveric um, studies are kind of conflicting, but what we do know is that it's effective. So let's have a look at a local anesthetic view as opposed to a bird's eye view. This is what the local anesthetic would see as you make contact with the trans transverse process. These are all the potential structures that it might come into contact with. You can see a dorsal ramus very nicely there. Uh, here's a dorsal ramus, here's a transverse process. You can actually see how you might get <coughs> a window through here into the paravertebral space. What about sonoanatomy? So what are we looking at here? So take away the skin, again, the trapezius, uh, we'll get the trapezius out of the way, we'll get the rhomboids out of the way, and then we'll highlight the erector spining muscles. And if we place a linear probe in a paramedian orientation on the back, you generate an image that comes up like here. So where's the probe? And there is the probe. And let's have a look. So here's the ultrasound image that you will generate. You've got this, this tombstone-like appearance of transverse processes, pleura, paravertebral space, and the muscles above it. So hopefully that's relatively nice and clear. So we'll start with the probe now, right over the ribs. So we start laterally, and we get this curve-shaped dropout shadow of the ribs. And as we slide towards the midline, you'll see the ribs transform into the transverse processes there. And I've put the arrow on the screen to, to, to emphasize that as you get towards the midline, you see the erector spinae muscle get thick, and it'll kind of appear out of nowhere. When you get that thick erector spinae muscle, the square-like or rectangular-like rectangular shape of the transverse processes and the fascia, that's when you're in the right place. So how do you cite the block? Well, we tend to have the patient either sitting, prone, or lateral, depending upon their clinical condition, uh, clinical condition and your ergonomics. Um, we tend to use a linear probe in most patients, but some patients, the body mass index may indicate that you need to use a curved array probe. Um, and you pick your level according to the procedure you're gonna do. So T4, T5 for chest wall procedures, and you usually get four dermatomes above and about four dermatomes below. Uh, for breast surgery, I tend to go a little bit higher. Um, and you can needle in plane um, either above, so kephalad to cordad or cordad to kephalad. It doesn't seem to really make a difference. This is a volume block. So we tend to use between 20 to 30 milliliters of local anesthetic per side. Uh, and in an ideal world, this is the kind of dermatomal spread that we'd aim to cover. This is a loss of sensation that we'd aim to get. Although again, it's not necessarily what we see in clinical practice. So let's have a look at some examples of ESP blocks. So here's a needle coming in from kephalad to cordad, passing through those lovely muscles. As we get to the corner of the transverse process, you inject local anesthetic. You can see the muscle lifting up there. So here's a bit more of the muscle lifting up. And you can see this black stripe of local anesthetic developing on the screen. That's a nice classical endpoint. There's another image on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see a slightly deeper patient or larger patient with a TUI needle. Look at that black area of local anesthetic opening up. Really nice place to open up and place a catheter in there. So what about some tips? Um, we would recommend using a seeker solution so that you don't waste the volume of local anesthetic you want to get uh, to the place where it needs to work. So either using saline or maybe even a dilute adrenaline-containing solution. Um, think about the volume that you're using. So if it's, you're going to use 30 milliliters and you're going to do bilateral blocks, make sure you stay within the maximum allowable dose of local anesthetic. When you get in the right place, you get this very classical stripe of local anesthetic developing along the, scre along the screen. So that's a nice sign that you're in the right place. Great place to put catheters. And rather than aim for the body of the transverse process, aim for the tip or the corner. I'll show you what I mean by that. If you aim for the top of the transverse process, the needle comes in, it's quite common for you to get an intramuscular injection and you see the whole erector spinae muscle get larger. That's not what we're aiming for. Whereas if you aim for the corner of the transverse process, the needle comes in, and as you inject local anesthetic, you get this stripe developing and the muscle lifts up off the transverse processes. It kind of looks like pulse tar flow. So when you inject and stop injecting, the muscle falls back down again. So in summary, um, this is a new block, the erector spinae plane block. It's got many potential indications. They're being described all the time. The safe, safety and efficacy studies are coming. So there aren't really uh, many significant risks associated with it. And we're getting more and more evidence of its use in different types of surgery. It's easy to perform. 
be performed preoperatively or postoperatively. Um, it avoids many of the issues of epidural, such as anticoagulation and whether you should cite it or not, um, and also the hypotensive effects of epidural analgesia. It may not quite be as effective as an epidural, but it certainly may be good enough in certain instances. And you could use this as a stepping stone to performing paravertebral blocks in the future and all the paraspinal variants. That's the end of my talk. Uh, here is a reading list. If you point your phone up to these images here, it will take you to the REUK website, a nice BJA education article, and some great videos produced by Dr. Jeff Gazden from Duke in North Carolina. Over the month of October, they did these Blocktober videos, so great videos that formed a lot of the inspiration of my talk here. And then there's an ASRA News article on the use of ESP for rib fractures. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much, and I look forward to asking uh, uh, to answering your questions later. Thank you.